But I'm going to focus a little more on the health considerations that we have around weaning uh, and, and the overall message when we're talking about our, our health considerations is that prevention is, is always going to be better than treatment. If we can prevent that disease from happening in the first place, uh, it's, it's always going to be better for the animal, better for us uh, than, than trying to treat that after the fact. So when we're talking about diseases around uh, weaning, we're really talking about coccidia being our number one concern. Uh, there's other internal parasites that play into this, but Dr. Whitney's going to cover that next week. So I hope you can come back and join us for that. And that'll be on May 12th. Then the other one we're going to talk about today is overeating disease, which is Clostridium perfringens, uh, usually Clostridium perfringens type D. Uh, we'll get on all of that. But the real issue that is stress and anything that causes amino, an immunocompromised animal and lowers that immune system. So what we really need to think about is minimizing stress wherever possible and then doing that by having correct management timing. Now we talked about castration and there's some conversation in the chat about late castration versus early castration. I'm a big fan of early castration uh, for our market animals. I think the earlier you can do it, the less stress it is for the animal. Now that does bring some concerns and some extra management steps that you might have to take based on the fact that you know that you're at a, a potentially increased risk for urinary calculi. But for me, dehorning and castration should happen in the first week of life because it's the, the least amount of stress that we can cause to that animal. So when we're talking about co coccidia, I, I think we get, we get a lot of questions about coccidia. I got a lot of questions about it when I was in practice. And the big thing that we need to know about coccidia is that there's a 21 day life cycle. So whenever I see an animal break with coccidia, I'm always looking 21 days before. Where was that animal 21 days ago? And that tells me where the exposure happened or the, where the big exposure happened to coccidia and, and caused my problem right now today. So you have to keep that in mind when you're trying to manage this situation, when you're trying to manage coccidia, because it might be that the stress of weaning brought out the ability of that coccidia to overgrow and cause an issue, but the exposure to that coccidia actually happened three weeks prior to that. Okay. So, it's all about stress again. And then we're going to keep coming back to it. You're probably going to get sick of me saying it. Okay. The other factor in all of this is pathogen accumulation in the environment and exposure, because a lot of this is dose dependent. When we're talking about scours for pretty much any species, we're talking about a dose dependent activity. Okay. So the more pathogens or the more bugs that that animal sees, the more likely they are to get sick and the more bugs that they see when they do get sick, the worse they'll be. Okay. So it's all dose dependent. So when we're talking about flow of pathogens and where things go, we're talking about that transfer is always from older animals to younger animals for the most part. Okay. There's some exceptions once the animals are sick because kids and lambs with scours become amplifiers. Okay. They become little factories for the bugs that cause them to get sick in the first place. But when we're thinking about path pathogen transfer, you got to think about everything coming from the older animals to the younger animals. And that becomes important as we move into some of these other concepts. So this is a graph we're gonna use over and over again. And I, I want you to pay attention to how we have it set up because it, it's my way of trying to explain how we can influence the immune system and the environment and how that all plays together and how, whether or not an animal gets a disease, okay? And we're primarily talking about coccidia with these, these graphs, but I think uh, it can apply to other diseases as well. So on the x-axis, we have age, okay? So that's just how old is the animal and then on the y-axis, we have pathogen particles in the kid or the lamb, okay? So how many bugs are actually in that animal? And the blue line there is our exposure, right? So that's how many, anim how many bugs got inside the animal. And for every disease, and in this case, you know, mostly scours, we're talking about there being a threshold for disease. So if that animal exposure gets high enough and it gets above the threshold, they'll get disease. So if that blue line gets above that red line, we get disease. Now the question that we have to ask ourselves is how do we influence these lines? Because I would argue we can, we can increase or decrease the blue line and we can increase or decrease the red line. And for me, that's how I try to think about these kind of things and all the different things that we do from our management system. So the most important thing for any kid or lamb is colostrum. And I would argue for any kid, lamb, 
calf, pretty much anything, colostrum is going to be the single most important thing they can get and the biggest predictor of their lifetime performance, okay? So if I have a failure of passive transfer, I have no colostrum, that, that animal didn't see anything, okay? They didn't get any antibodies from mom, no protection. All we've done is taken that red line and moved it way down, okay? So it's way down and that animal has to see almost nothing to get sick because they have no immune system. We've changed where that red line goes. Now we can do it the other way, right? If we do a great job with colostrum, excellent quality, excellent quality, we can move that red line way up. It can go all the way to the top and we can make it very difficult to get that animal sick unless they see a massive amount of pathogens or massive, massive amount of bugs or any, anything that we're trying to avoid as far as scours or anything like that, okay? Now excessive stress does the same thing. It lowers that red line because it suppresses the immune system and it causes that animal to not be able to see too many bugs before they get the disease. And basically anything that causes an immunocompromised state. So that's stress, that's the definition of failure of passive transfer, no colostrum, that's uh, inadequate body condition. I would argue that's actually over body condition. So over conditioning would do the same thing because it, it, it causes a suppression in that immune system. Okay, and then that applies to just about everything that we're doing with that animal, including mineral. Okay, so we can, we can lower that red line by quite a bit uh, with all these different things that we can do. Now, the, the good thing about that is that we can also raise it. Okay, so vaccine is one of the ways that we can do that. Now, it's important to note, vaccine is not a silver bullet. It's not a solution to a problem. It's insurance. Okay it raises that red line. So that animal can still get sick if it's exposed enough, but it's decreased the chance that they will. Okay, so that's how I think about vaccine. Now, when we talk about nutrition, we can do the same thing. If we're taking care of those animals and we are keeping them at the correct body condition, we can get quality nutrition and that will raise that red line as well. It'll prevent us from having an issue or make it less likely that we'll have an issue. So here's how we move the blue line in a bad way, okay? Excuse me one second. <coughs> so we can make it way worse. We can make it so that animal is exposed to a lot of pathogens, a lot of pathogens. So to me, the biggest enemy is mud. And I'll show you this because it, all we've done is create this exposure that's really high and it's above that, that threshold, that disease threshold. Another way we can do that is that we have this issue with accumulation. These bugs are extremely hardy. They last in the environment and they can build up over time. Okay, so we can create a situation where the environment that that animal is in is just super high and their exposure is always gonna be above that disease line. There's lots of different things to, to think about. Now, when I think about disease prevention and order of importance for health, the big thing I think about is colostrum is always going to be number one. Did they get enough and did, was it high enough quality? Okay. Damn health and nutrition is going to be number three, mostly because it's nutrition for the lamb or the kid. And it's also uh, influences the colostrum consumption and the quality. Then it's all about the environment. How many bugs are they going to see? Can we keep it clean and dry enough? And can we keep pathogens or bugs from building up in the environment? After that, it's Kim and kid and lamb nutrition. And we're talking about weaning. You know, Travis went into rations a little bit and how much they should be, should be getting. And it's all about stepping things slow so we can avoid our second disease that we'll talk about, which is the overeating. Then it's that all this added stress that we talk about. There's so many different ways to add stress to this, this kid or this lamb's life. And we need to avoid those when possible so that we can avoid the immunosuppression that we see. Coccidia stats. There's some questions about this and we'll get into it about what you should do. It'll be pretty general. Um, so you'll have to work with your nutritionist or your veterinarian to figure out the very specifics of what you want to do on your operation, but we'll get into coccidia stats. Genetics can always play a part. And I, I put this at the end or close to the end because it reminds me that I will take a poor genetic animal that's managed very, very well over a high genetic animal that's treated very poorly every single time. 
every single time. So genetics plays a part in this. It always plays a part in everything, but management and how you run your operation is going to be always more important than the genetic merit or value of that animal. And then products given to kids or lambs at birth. You know, there's just not a lot of data out there on this. And, and to me, even if there was data out there on, on these, some of these products, uh, all this other stuff on the list is going to matter more than that. And I would argue in a lot of cases, the products that you would give at birth or close to birth, um, excluding some situations where we talk about CD and T, uh, those are not going to do as much for you as everything else on this list. So let's get into damn health and nutrition. We're not going to get into classroom specifics because I think if you take care of mom, for the most part, a lot of the, the classroom consumption and the quality and having enough, so the quantity is going to be taken care of by having good damn health and nutrition. So from a nutrition point of view, when I say nutrition, I think in big, big, broad strokes. Okay. I'm not a nutritionist. That's why you should work with one if you have specific questions. Uh, or I'm sure Whitney or Travis can answer some of these, these questions better than I can. But when I think of nutrition, I think of energy and protein being the two big things I think about. And I think about those as being most important late gestation. Okay, so we can really affect that kid or that lamb's life based on how much nutrition mom got late gestation. So late in the pregnancy. Okay. Now mineral is another topic that comes up. Um, and I get pretty fired up about mineral uh, when it comes to cattle, for sure. On the sheep and goat side, we just need to make sure that we're specific for sheep or specific for goats, okay? And I prefer that it's force-fed. I, I mean, loose mineral, free choice is fine. I'm not a big fan of mineral blocks or um, lick tubs or anything like that. I don't think they do enough for us. Um, and they become a source of the animal's entertaining themselves more than they are actually a benefit to getting mineral. So I prefer force feeding things when I can at the correct level so we can guarantee there's enough for every animal and they're getting the correct amount. Now the big thing is copper and that's why you want to get a goat specific or a sheep specific mineral because you can't be feeding these animals as much copper as you would feed a cow. Uh, you will kill them if you do that. Uh, it might not be right away but uh, they will store that copper in their liver and cause issues later in life or whenever they get stressed. So make sure you're using a goat or sheep specific mineral. Now, logistics and facilities play a lot into nutrition and we'll talk a little bit about bunk space, but um, even just what cut of hay you're feeding when, right? So how you stack your hay in your barn based on when you harvested it, just make sure you have available your best hay for late gestation, early lactation, um, because that's what, you need to be feeding to get that correct energy and protein during those stages. So these are just a list of things that can happen that I think all affect weaning when we're talking about management health. Uh, if you don't get that animal, uh, the mom, those are use that correct nutrition, correct energy and protein later in gestation, you get lighter birth weight kids or lighter birth weight lambs but you don't get any decline in dystocia. So they're, they're lighter, but you still have having issues, lambing or kidding. You get lower survival. And then after that, you get lower milk production, lower kid growth, which affects our health at weaning, affects our body condition at weaning. And then even for mom, that's an issue because then we get delayed return to estrus. So if you're, especially for these really high uh, throughput systems, when you're trying to get a lot of turns, you're just gonna get later and later and later. And then I was going to slip later and later and later into the lambing window or the kidding window. And it increases the likelihood that she's going to leave the herd before she had to. Okay. So bunk space, big, big, big soapbox issue of mine. I, I think bunk space is mishandled in a lot of different areas, dairies, beef, sheep, goats. It's all an issue of bunk space a lot of the time. Everyone has to have an equal opportunity to eat. And for me, that's about a foot per kid or lamb when we're talking about, you know, how much bunk space needs to be per animal. And then uh, 16 to 20 inches per doe or lamb. And if you have really, really big animals, uh, getting up to two feet per animal, two feet per head 
is definitely warranted, especially when we're talking late gestation, early lactation. You have to have enough bunk space so that everyone can eat, especially if you're going to limit feed at any point. You have to have enough bunk space. And ideally, you'd separate by age just so that your, your boss use or the, your boss does don't just bang everybody out of the bunk and keep the, the younger animals off. And what happens if you don't have enough bunk space is your fat animals get fatter and your skinny animals stay skinny. Okay? And that, that's not what you want to see. A lot of times when I walk onto an operation, I can and somewhat tell what bunk space is going to look like because I can see that there's a huge, huge range of animals, huge range of animals in terms of body condition. And that's usually because bunk space is inadequate. There's some other issues with that as far as parasites. And I'm sure Whitney can talk a little bit about that later. But it, it's, it's all about getting a uniform body condition, okay? And it, it only gets worse if we have inadequate body, inadequate bunk space and then we mix our age groups because you know it's your replacements and it's your, your animals that are still growing that are missing out. And they're actually the ones that need the nutrition the most, okay? So you get your big fat boss you or your boss doe up there getting fatter and you get your replacements that are just slipping because of it. So you got to have enough bunk space. And like I said, we want uniform moms, uniform dams, okay? Everyone at the correct body condition and adequate nutrition year round with preferably a force fed mineral. And then what we're looking at is that we get the correct colostrum quantity, the correct colostrum quality. We get the best milk production we can so we can handle those extras, those triplets, those quads if we need to and not run mom down too much and get those, those animals to grow. And then she returns to estrus on time and she gets bred again and she doesn't slip later into our window. Okay, let's get to pathogens. Pathogens, it's all about clean and dry. Clean and dry, clean and dry. You got to stay clean and dry as much as you can. I've been on farms. I've practiced as a veterinarian. I know that sometimes this is very difficult and it's not possible to have an immaculate farm all the time. I know that. And especially when people work day jobs, uh, it, it, it's very hard to do. Uh, so there is... I'm painting it black and white, but there's a lot of gray area here. You, you have to be able to be realistic about some of this. Okay, so mud. What is mud? This is one of my favorite slides from one of my professors in vet school. Tim always said mud is not what you think it is. It's not water and dirt, okay? Mud is manure, urine, and there's only a tiny bit of dirt there, okay? So we think about that. It just means that there's a perfect environment for, for bugs to grow. So we have to control mud. Okay, accumulation is a big deal. These bugs live in the environment and they stay there, okay? So I changed the graph a little bit. I got time on the x-axis and I've got pathogen particles in the environment, so just bugs in the environment. Think of it as coccidia if you want. If I don't have any scours, I get a straight line like this where I've got scours moving up or the pathogens accumulating in the environment over time. They're getting higher and higher. If I get scours, that amplifies those animals just make more and more and more and more bugs and it gets worse and worse and worse. And there's more and more, more pathogens in the environment or bugs in the environment. And remember our disease line, this matters because it's all dose dependent. Like I said earlier, we have to keep this line level and as low as we can. So here's the other piece of this same graph. Okay. If I have multiple turns or you can think about this as year to year, if my animals always have access to the same spot that they either lamb or kid, or they always have access to the, the pen that the weaning animals are going to, the weaned animals are going to be in. Okay. Every turn I'm accumulating pathogens. And if I don't clean that or they never are not in there, the next turn doesn't start at zero. We continue to accumulate. Okay. And then the same thing with turn three. So you can see wow. that those animals don't really have a chance later in the turns because they're starting with pathogens that are so high in the environment already. And it's something that we have to, uh, we have to address. So solutions for this designated areas that you don't use any other time of the year, start clean. Okay. Time, sunlight, keeping things dry is what kills pathogens. Okay. So designated areas that you don't use for the rest of the year and you don't allow 
animals to have access, except for that specific time that you're worried about, will keep pathogen accumulation low. Okay, cleaning is a big piece of this, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Concrete is your biggest friend. It's your biggest friend by far because it keeps everything clean and it allows you to scrape things aggressively and keep the mud low. Rotating is great. Okay, so if you can get animals to a clean environment and take them to someplace else, you've, you've made it so that they're in a fresh environment with low pathogen accumulation. So cleaning, what does that mean when I say that? Usually it just means removing the majority of, or, majority of organic material, okay? Disinfectants don't work. Nothing works if you don't just get most of the material out of there. Now, sunlight is our cheapest and one of our most effective disinfectants, okay? Sunlight is great. And then right after that would be dry. Desiccation kills a lot of things. So if you can get sunlight on an area and keep it dry, you can kill most of the bugs that we worry about in the environment, okay? Now, if you're worried about a confinement area or a traffic area, I like chlorine dioxide. It's a very, very versatile chemical. You can mix it in all sorts of different concentrations so that it's really concentrated when you're spraying something down that, that uh, the animals touch all the time, like a gate or the walls or the, the ground. Um, but you can also mix it in concentrations so where it's safe to use on feeding equipment and things like that. So that's one of my favorite things to use. I'm not going to get into kid nutrition a whole lot because it's, it's mostly about bunk space. And like I said, I'm not a nutritionist when it comes to ration building and things like that. And that's something you need to talk to uh, Whitney or Travis about. But for the most part, if you take care of mom, she'll then take care of the kid and everything will be easier. So make sure you take care of mom. Kid stress, this is something we, str we, we need to talk about quite a bit because you can influence this a lot. Overcrowding is one of the biggest ones. You gotta have enough pen space, which goes along with bunk space. And then you need to handle these animals calmly and correctly. You can't be adding stress in that situation. Cold and hot, weather plays into it, having ways for them to get, to get out of that situation uh, and having shade and then having a place for them to go to get warm as well. Uh, and then, like I said, castration and dehorning. We're adding a lot, an, an incredible amount of stress if we wait on those things, especially if people are tempted to do it around weaning. It's just not a good option, uh, in my opinion. All right, this, uh, this is also here. Water is one of my other big soapboxes, and you can, you can probably tell I have a lot of them. But kids need water all the time. It's the most important nu nutrient, and even before they're weaned. They need water, okay? And you need to figure out, can they reach the water or the same one, or do you have to put something else in, or what, what do you need to do? But they need access to water all the time, okay? Now, if they can't reach it, and they don't know where to go to get water, or they, for whatever reason, it's not available, they'll find it, okay? They'll drink out of these mud puddles, and at that point, they're just drinking poop water, okay? And that just creates that blue line that goes straight through the roof because they're exposed to all those different pathogens. So here's where we get into coccidia stats. I think about coccidia stats, again, as insurance, okay? They're not an end-all be-all solution. It doesn't take the place of management. It doesn't take the place of cleaning. It doesn't take the place of uh, pathogen accumulation or solve all those things. They're insurance and they're an added tool that are super helpful. Uh, and I, I think they should be in every ration, but Again, they're insurance, they're added, the added insurance. Okay, so here's where we get into the, the three that we talk about, Decox, Rumensin, and Bovatec. Big, big thing right away. Bovatec is labeled for sheep, but not goats. Rumensin is labeled for goats, but not sheep. Okay, so you have to know that because you cannot feed something that's not labeled to one of these, these groups of animals uh, if there's another one available. Okay, you have to have be feeding something that's on label. Now, I am a huge fan of rumensin. So if you're a goat owner, I, I think rumensin is the way to go because I think it's more effective, it's cheaper, and I don't know what more you want from a product if it's, uh, if it's inexpensive and effective. Um, it should be available to me. It should be available right away. It should be in that creep feed or, or, or whatever you're giving the kids to encourage them to, to eat something and develop that rumen. Uh, and then if you are going to feed it to the does, the, the most important time for me is in late gestation, early lactation, but right around weaning as well, because you need to, again, 
make that environment as clean as possible. And if you can decrease the shedding, and remember the, the, the life cycle time of that coccidia is three weeks. So be thinking kind of with a three week lag time in mind, you need to decrease shedding for the environment so that when those kids are stressed at weaning, they're not breaking with coccidia. Okay, let's talk about overeating. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm sorry, I'm going pretty fast. We had a lot to cover, but overeating disease or enterotoxemia, Travis touched on it quickly. It's Clostridium perfringens, that's what we're worried about. And what we're actually worried about is the bug produces a toxin. Okay, so this bacteria produces a toxin that is extremely potent and, and causes issues in the gastrointestinal tract. And what you see is a loss of appetite, really watery diarrhea that sometimes has blood. Uh, it depends on how bad it is. Sometimes they get bloat. There's definitely a lot of abdominal discomfort because of this. And they're just run, run down, lethargic, depressed. They look like, uh, and, and they can die very quickly because that toxin is so bad. This is also sometimes called pulpy kidney disease. That's more for uh, us to look for when we do necropsies and, and look for those kidney effects because that toxin, again, so potent, it, it does affect other organs than, than the local organs in the GI tract. So here's some of the things that are associated with overeating disease. And, and this is, it, it's basically when you're thinking about weaning time, you're thinking about grain overloads or getting too much grain too fast. So assess, excessive amounts of milk or grain are associated with overeating disease. Stress, again, we've been harping on stress and keeping that as low as possible. Heavy parasite loads are also associated with it, and, and Whitney will cover uh, how to take care of that. And then, again, high grain, low roughage diets that with animals, especially that are not used to that. So Travis showed you some ways to step up as, you, as those animals get bigger, but you have to do that slowly. And I'm going to throw in inadequate bunk space because if you don't have enough bunk space, uh, everyone knows they have to fight for bunk and they know that. So when you feed, they, they, they charge the bunk, okay? They, they, they mash the bunk, they charge it, and, and they, they go to town and they eat too fast and they take big mouthfuls. They don't chew, all these things that cause more issues with this disease. So what do we do about it? Well, prevention is always better. So that uh, is of course vaccines traditionally, but I would argue that it's more correct or it's more important to have a correct ration, step up slowly, proper bunk space, and then keep stress low, and then use that vaccine as insurance, not a solution. The vaccine I'm talking about, Clostridium perfringens C and D, we usually get T in there as well, which is tetanus, which is a great idea, especially for our goats, as they're pretty susceptible. When you want to give that, four weeks of age, three to four weeks later at eight weeks of age. That way you're covered before weaning, okay, before weaning, which is, is crucial. And then once a year after that, at least, okay? And I like to do that six weeks before kidding. That gives you some protection in the colostrum as well um, because those bucks and doe, the bucks and does, I'm sorry, no, the bucks are not going to put down colostrum, but the does and the ewes are going to put down colostrum. And they're going to do that fairly, actually earlier than we ever thought. So getting it in pretty early while they're laying down colostrum allows them to build antibodies to put it in the colostrum, which will then protect the, the kid or the lamb. So that's my timing on that. I know we had a question about that earlier. Again, just like Travis ended, we'll end with talking about mom and don't forget about her. You have to monitor for mastitis when you are, when you are looking at this whole process. She's going to have a, an udder full of milk. And, and it's not going to be leaving there that causes all sorts of inflammation and, and can lead to mastitis. We do want to reduce the calorie intake, like, like Travis was talking about. You know, we want to give them poor quality hay, even straw, like he said, where they get some, they get some fill, but they're not actually getting a ton of calories. Uh, I would argue that, that withholding water, like, like Travis said, 100% withholding water used to be a recommendation. They used to say 24 hours with no water. Uh, I would argue that's that's pretty close to inhumane uh, and and not an, a recommendation I would go with. Uh, we should never be withholding water from any animal at any time. Uh, now, if you want to limit it, uh, I think that's okay uh, to some extent. I would argue that if you just change the ration, that should take care of itself. Um, but again, don't be withholding water or taking it away completely. Okay, 
Travis talked about body condition and we're almost done here. So don't, don't, if you're asleep, you can come back in. I think this is a really big, big point right now. We used to think that a drop in body condition after kidding, after lambing was unavoidable. And some of the things that we're finding, especially on, on the cattle side and the dairy side is suggesting that this is not necessarily true. If you can manage your nutrition well enough and manage your ration correctly, have enough bunk space, you can maintain a body condition that's stable uh, year round. Now, I'm I'm not saying there's going to be there's not going to be exceptions to this. You know that mom who milks a ridiculous amount and raises quads. Okay, maybe there's exceptions, but. For the most part, maintaining a stable condition has huge, huge reproductive implications, okay? If you can get them to maintain or gain weight after kidding or lambing, you are in a significantly better spot when it comes to getting that animal rebred. And for me, it, it should be stable. And if you can keep it as stable as you can, and one of the biggest factors in this is, are they fat coming into kidding or lambing to begin with? Okay, so if they start fat, it's pretty hard to maintain or gain after they kid. And that leads to all sorts of different complications as far as, as energy uh, requirements and things like that. Uh, when you have that extra inflammation and all these things that are associated with being too heavy and over conditioned. So I like to aim uh, at trying to maintain. And I think we've learned by now that it is possible to maintain a body condition and not actually have to lose any afterwards. So with that, I'm done. Uh, make sure you guys are tuning in next week. Uh, we're going to do this all again Tuesday. Uh, Whitney's going to talk about parasites. And then on Thursday, Brenda's going to talk about a topic that ties really well into that, which is pasture management. I think we'll take questions now, but I'll... I'll uh, with permission, I can grab a quick one uh, to, to fill some time. And so initially, one right at the beginning um, was, uh, was requested is, is it okay to feed alf alfalfa pellets uh, to sheep in the winter. And in fact, I think that's one of the better ideas that there is. Uh, and so particularly if you don't have access to um, small square bales or they're very expensive, um, or if you, uh, you know, the large round bales or round, or round bales or square bales uh, certainly are gonna be a little tougher to flake off uh, potentially because they're frozen. And obviously they're a lot, um, larger in in terms of just uh, uh resources that for your location so i'm absolutely on board for alfalfa um, pellets to be used for for sheep or goats thanks uh colleen and brenda do you want to pull any of the other questions that you've seen in the chat i'll, I'll take a vaccine question that i see right in here um just sitting sitting right there um, the question is if I vaccinate at four weeks of the booster at eight at, and then, and booster at eight weeks at weaning, is that booster causing stress? And, uh, what about vaccinating for respiratory issues? So I'll say that, that, that booster at, at weaning, if you're going to wean at eight weeks and booster at the same time, yes, you are causing stress with that booster. Anytime we give an injection anytime we give a vaccine. Uh, and, and honestly, if you injected nothing but sterile saline, which should do nothing in the animal, that's still stress. I, I prefer to see, I really do prefer to see vaccines in before weaning. Now, is that always possible? No, but uh, it's something you have to be aware of. And it just means that you have to be um, that much better at everything else and at reducing stress and as many other factors as you can. So to me, that's, yes, you, it is causing stress. And if you can wait to wean till 10 weeks, that'd be great. Or you could consider, you know, maybe you should vaccinate at three and seven or four and seven, you know, I, the minimum time between vaccines would be three weeks for me. Um, so you could, you could do it at seven. Another one that popped up in the chat here is, will the does at some point just bump the kids off during nursing without intervention, or is it imperative that I actively wean? 
I, I guess I can take a stab at that and I should probably finish answering the question before, but um, the eventually, yes, they will, they will self wean uh, eventually. Um, but I see a lot of really old animals still nursing. Uh, and as long as there is something pulling milk out of that udder, she will most likely still pro- continue to produce milk. So I'm a big fan of actively weaning. Um, maybe Travis has some comments on that. Before we get to that, I'll answer the respiratory vaccine question. Yes. Um, there are some vaccines that are available. It's very important and when we're talking about certain bacteria to get a vaccine that is specific for goats or sheep and not use a cattle vaccine. Because some of the things that we know about some of these bacteria, we're actually, we're, we're vaccinating for a specific toxin. Uh, when I'm thinking about respiratory, I'm thinking about leukotoxin, which is a, a factor for some of our bacteria. And that is species specific. So you need to get a manhemia leukotoxin vaccine that is specific for goats. Now, everything else, for the most part, I don't, I don't see as labeled. Um, when we're talking about things like intranasals, like Enforce and things like that, have I used them in goats? Yes. Do I think I actually vaccinated for anything? No. I think I got an interferon response that caused some, uh, some other immune things to happen that helped those goats, but, but they're not actually vaccines um, that are labeled or actually create immunity for things that we worry about. So uh, with that, I guess it's all Travis now to try to answer uh, the other question. Well, I would say that it's, uh, in my personal opinion, more correct to to actively wean instead of just wing it and keep them together. Um, and I would agree that you know once they are um, are still a suckling animal, the female will still try to produce milk. But the real answer is that they're not producing enough that that animal can sustain on relative to where their body requirements are. And so it's better for both of the animals because. The doe slash you can say, okay, that's enough. And then the lamb slash kid can transition to where it could and should be at that point. And so I just think that it's better for both of those. Um, I'll take one here. Um, and then we're being our own moderators, but hopefully that works out. But my goats are all uh, together and the kids are munching on grain. Do I need to be more proactive in separating them during feeding somehow? So this is really fun, all right, because now – I can just take Joe's answer and say, it's all about bunk space. Um, but, um, and part of that would be true, but what I would say on that, and then I, I didn't show a very good picture of it, is to, to identify a location where you can keep those younger ones. Um, and so the, the slatted gates that allow for the young animals to go in and the older dams to not go in allows you the opportunity, even if you were so... Uh, to choose a, a water with a, a um, you know, an additive in it to help us out in terms of health, or um, we can be able to change it a little bit. And so that allows them their own kind of home. And so that's how I would be proactive in it. Uh, it's not that we need to request um, weaning at four weeks, um, but that allows a, a spot for them to, to kind of be a little bit better. And the other thing that I didn't do a very good job of explaining then is that it's also then best to take the, the females, okay, the, the mothers, away from the babies because then the babies know where home is. And they're like, hey, I was just here. I was just hanging out in this creep pen. And now mom's gone instead of taking them away because then if you take them away, then they're now at a new place. And I talked about that vaguely with one bullet point on familiarity. And so – um, one of the largest challenges, and this is, this is crazy to me, that you know sheep that come off of a mountain and have been hanging out on pastures all their lives, and then you put them in a, um, in a lamb feedlot, if you were to sort of transition that, you're obviously going to keep it very, very hay-based. And I'm not saying this is how Minnesota works in general, but sheep just, it, it, and, and goats take a while to, to transition in their head that this is a new home. And so the best we can do to decrease that amount of stress is that now that you have those in a location, provide a spot that they're used to eating. And then when you remove the, um, the use or does 
um, and then you take that away, that they still know where home base is and they'll be much, much more comfortable. A couple of questions. Um, this is Colleen, University of Minnesota Extension, Scott and Carver County. Um, so a couple of things. What's the best diet for a weather? And then what about feeding dry beet pulp? And then if the ewe has been on hay and pasture, how much alfalfa hay should you introduce at late gestation? So kind well, of the three questions. Okay, thanks. Um, so the first one is the, the beet pulp. And so beet pulp can be good and is good um, for our goats. Primarily it's good in terms of just energy and fiber. Uh, it's not a high protein um, feed stuff, but it, it can uh, provide both fiber and energy um, for those. So the beet pulp is good and that could be put in there. Um, if you use Ben on hay and pasture, I think that, again, that's way uh, general of a question, Brenda, but what we could say is ad identify where we're at on the one, two, three, four, and five of our body condition score, and that allows us the opportunity. In fact, what I would say to accentuate that is that if we have two different groups or say, hey, these are good and these need a little bit more then maybe the ones that are good uh, is where you kind of put the alfalfa hay and the ones that need a little bit more get alfalfa hay and a pound of corn. And so um, I think that if you have the opportunity, even at, when you're at a late gestation time period to manage separately, um, that provides you uh, at least a, a good option. And um, the question on best diet for a weather, truthfully, rams, weathers, um, bucks, does, use, uh, that's not the gender isn't nearly as large of a, a problem as it is the age and the transitioning thing. So everything that we've said, in my opinion, so far um, relative to our nutrition and our feedstuffs uh, can be um, attached to all of the, the gender groups. I think that the only thing I'll add to that is that the best diet for a weather, I think the big thing to know right away, and this is something I learned in practice is that you need to know, is that a commercial animal or is it a, a pet? right? So if that weather is a pet, uh, the diet for me changes quite a bit because now I'm worried about um, the length of time that I'm going to be on a certain ration. And I'm, I'm worried more about urinary calculi because that, that life, there's just more, there's more chance of it happening because that animal is going to live longer. Um, so for me, I look at it being, you need to, you, you need to decide, you know, what you're, what you're using, you know, is it a, is it a pet? Then I would say it's, it's, it's more likely that you're going to have a pretty high roughage diet, high quality roughage diet. And, and, uh, and it'll be a lot different than a commercial situation. Yeah. So it, it, the, I'm seeing in the chat that the weather's a pet. So yes, that's something you need to work with uh, your veterinarian your nutritionist on, but you're going to see a lot more high quality roughage and 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 lower amounts of grain in that situation and that'll help prevent urinary calculi as well and you can like travis mentioned you can supplement with ammonium chloride if you need to periodically i know a lot of people do that they they feed it on and then off and on and off just to try to to help with that situation well played and in fact uh, i didn't gather it everything that i needed there because is there if there's a weather um the other thing is is that obviously um it's not going to uh, uh, our breeding program. And so the thing of, from a portion of that is identify our target weight. I had that quickly on a slide of say, what is my target weight and what is my target timeline that I'm being able to evaluate? And even on a more crazier standpoint, if you're a 4-H or FFA and have a, um, a goat that you're wishing to exhibit, if and when we get to exhibit at fairs and expositions, um, then that's a different game as well. And truthfully, uh, it is more expensive, uh, but some of those show diets um, are rationed for those animals. And it, it's not, you can, you can still be able to raise high quality animals on using a corn and oats and a soybean and, and a protein concentrate, but those diets are formulated and they know what they're doing. Um, and so if you can afford that option, it's a, a, a premium option for you. So I'm, I'm seeing another question here, something about, uh, and maybe Whitney will be willing to comment. Um, we have uh, alfalfa latent gestation and, and they were warned not to do it because it affects calcium absorption. And I think this is a reference to DCAD diets, um, which are 
uh, limiting certain certain positive cations to to make it so that you're you're actually in um, you're actually creating a state where receptors are are more likely to be receptive to certain hormones that allow access to calcium. I I'm not aware of I'm honestly not aware of using decad in in, in goats or sheep and and. Uh, that's not something I know enough about. So maybe Whitney's willing to comment on that one. Uh, sure. Um, I, I, my philosophy, especially with late gestation, small ruminants, is energy over anything. So if you're using the, the alfalfa as providing energy to that rumen to support those fetuses in late gestation, I we don't really see... Um, a lot of hypocalcemia, like milk fever, like we do in dairy cattle, as it relates to, to calcium feeding um, during gestation. Um, I, I'm aware of some large goat dairies that are there's messing around with DCAD. Um, so, so that is something that can be done, but has to be done on a large scale. And goats are a little more picky than cattle as far as palatability. Um, so yeah, I think I would err on the side of saying, I don't know, but I would prioritize energy over anything else. Okay. And thank you for that. Um, there was a question earlier too, um, will maternal antibodies interfere with the vaccine? If you vaccinate at four and eight weeks, if you vaccinated the U's and does before partition. Sorry, go ahead one more time, Clean. I didn't yep. catch all of that. Yep. Will maternal antibodies interfere with the vaccine if you vaccinate at four and eight weeks, if you vaccinated the ewes and does before um, parturition? Okay, so, so I would say maternal interference is something we always worry about. So that would be the process of antibodies in the colostrum interfering with vaccine. So what we know about that is ideally i would say we're not going to have any more interference i mean maybe a small amount but a minimal amount of more interference uh when we vaccinate versus when we don't while the animal is pregnant now what we do know is that there likely is maternal interference to those vaccinations no matter what we do but we, but we know that they are protective because we have enough data and we have enough studies that show us that they, they do change the prevalence of certain diseases and, and things like that. So we're seeing that, that regardless of whether or not there's maternal interference, we're getting protection out of those vaccines. Um, and I'm not willing to give up the extra protection from the colostrum that we need to have, especially for those first four weeks uh, of life by not giving, I'm not willing to give up that shot during pregnancy. Um, so the answer is likely yes, but I, I don't think I care because I know that I'm getting protection from those shots regardless. Oh, okay. I am. Can you hear me, Joe? Okay. Also, what would be a good feed additive to help get more body condition on a milking doe? She is on pasture and Purina goat chow. She is a heavy milker, won't finish her grain, and is thin. Wondering if I can add a feed stuff to help. Also, how can we find a nutritionist to work with? How can we find our extension agent in our area? So I think we, we answered the, the extension agent question in the chat. There's, there's a, a local extension map and, and different offices you can contact to try to find your local educator. And to me, that's the best way to contact anybody at extension is to start with your local educator because they uh, are, are amazing and they know a lot of stuff. Uh, and if they don't have the answer, they can get it very quickly from one of us or, or, or send the question to somebody that they need to um, but I, I love starting with them. I ask them questions all the time because they, they have answers for me uh, all the time. So start there, start with that, that link that was posted in the chat there. Um, okay, as far as what to give that, that the goat uh, to put weight on, uh, it's grain is energy. 
that's that's my answer. Grain is energy, high quality hay um, or alfalfa. And then, and then double checking with your veterinarian to make sure that there's not something else going on if you're worried about a specific animal. Because I, I, I tend to worry about in older animals, I worry about teeth. Um, teeth, uh, if they're not there, it's hard to chew uh, and hard to, hard to get enough energy out of your feedstuffs and specific feedstuffs. Uh, so I, that, that's my answer on that. Grain is energy. Do it slowly. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Is it reasonable to target rebreeding does 30 days after weaning? Obviously, nutrition will be the determining factor. I think that's a that's a systems question, is, and and I'm going to be very honest. I'm more familiar familiar with cattle systems, but um, I think that's probably reasonable if I think about the time frame. Um, Again, it's it's nutrition based. It's a it's all about nutrition, and it depends on when you wean as well, right? If you wait till 120 days uh, of age to wean, then you're then that definitely. Uh, if you're weaning at some kind of uh, increased schedule at uh, 45 days or something weird like that, then then maybe that's not not so much. But um, and, Travis, any thoughts? And body I, I think that's a, go ahead. I think that's the correct answer. Uh, Clean, you wanted to add, or maybe a body condition score of those, but um, yeah, you, you can get those um, exposed. And and I guess the this isn't this isn't the the textbook answer, but the body will allow them the opportunity to get bred if they so choose. And so if they are behind relative to nutrition and or plans, um, then that's nature saying, nope, take a break. And so. I think that that's a thing to consider as well. Okay. What about spent beer brew, brewing grains as a supplement for sheep? So the, 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 we always get questions about spent grains for any species. And, and the issue is always how much are you going to get? How quickly can you feed it? Cause you can't store it. That, that's the issue. Um, you have to pick it up fairly frequently or have it delivered and it, it does not store well. It grows all sorts of funky stuff. So um, that's, that's a big issue. And then, uh, you know, Travis touched on calcium to phosphorus ratio and spent, spent grains can have a very, very, they can be all over the board depending on what beer you're brewing and things like that. So um, the issue is storage, uh, honestly. So I think, uh, you can do it. I don't think I would feed them a high percentage of that, um, which makes it harder because most of the time a brewery is not going to give you five pounds at a time or whatever you're trying to do. I suggest more than uh, about 30%, 30 to 40% at the most um, relative to the part of their diet. Okay. But, um, somebody did ask a question earlier too. I, um, about the weaning schedule. Is it best to pull the kids and be done or wean them at night? So I would say that, that that's all the, I don't think it matters to be honest. I, I would say um, you can try to gradual wean if you want, but the, the better, the better solution is to make sure that those animals are ready to just be done because they should have been kind of doing that already by also transferring to creep and and, and doing other things and, and developing the rumen uh, with grain and, and pasture. So for me, I, I, would, I want the simplest and le least amount of handling possible and focus your, your time on something else. So I like to just pull the kids and be done. I think that's that's the um, that's the questions that I have, Brenda, Claire. Is there anything that I missed? Um, we do have time for a couple more questions. If you want to put something in the chat box, um, the question on finding your local county extension educator. We do have our contact information on um, um, on this presentation, and any of us certainly can help you find your local county extension educator in your county. Um, thank you for all your good questions as well. And if you're not from Minnesota, we can also help you 
find extension in your state as well. All right, um, a question coming in about accessing the slides. We will be sending out the recordings of the whole webinar um, series after the conclusion. So after next Thursday, we'll be sending those out. So those will have the slides in the recordings. Yeah. Oh, another one is, oh, you, it looks like Joe, you answered it in the chat. Yeah, yeah kind of. So um, I honestly don't think it matters between cut and banding. Some of it has to do with size. Um, never pinch. That is the answer for that question. Very, very straightforward. Never pinch. Um, I prefer cutting because I have them. I got them. I got both. Uh, I can count to two very easily and they're not attached to the animal anymore. So that's my preferred method. If they get too big, then I go to banding. And again, same rules apply. You have to count to two and they better be below the band, um, but never pinch. All right, we'll just give a second if anyone has another last minute question here. Otherwise, we're coming up on eight o'clock. So thank you for joining us tonight for the webinar.